We're going to go over the scientific method. This is going to go fairly quickly, so keep in mind you can pause or replay this. If you'd like to reference your book, you should look at pages 4 through 8. And there is also additional information in the appendix in A-8. One of the key ideas when conducting a scientific experiment is to make sure that only one variable is changed. For example, if I want to find out the effect of sunlight on a plant's growth, I need to make sure that everything is kept the same except the sun sunlight. All these other things that I keep the same are called controlled variables. So, if I have plants that grow in 12 hours of sunlight, 6 hours, and 0 hours, I want to make sure that the plants have the same amount of soil, same type of soil, same amount of water, same amount of nutrients, that I'm using the same kind of plant in all of the experiment. All these things that I keep the same here are called the controlled variables. The reason why do I need to have these controlled variables? I want to make sure that none of these are affecting the growth. I need to make sure that the variable I'm changing is actually the reason for the data. Some other variables we have to understand include the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable is what the scientist changes. So in my example, it was the number of hours of sunlight. The dependent variable is what changes, also known as your data collected. I try to remember these by remembering my dependent is my data. D and D go together. So if I grow plants with 12 hours of sunlight or no sunlight, what am I changing? Well, my independent variable is either 12 hours of sunlight or no sunlight. So the amount of sunlight, the number of hours of sunlight. My dependent variable is what I'm recording, the data I'm collecting, which is the growth of the plants. Some other variables you will hear named include the experimental group. That's the group that has the variable changed. So in our example, that would be the group with no sunlight. And then there is the control group, which is the group that is under normal conditions. Normally, plants get 12 hours of sunlight. So that is our control, the number, uh, I'm sorry, the 12 hour sunlight group. It's important that you understand all of these different kinds of variables and your experimental group or your control group because you're going to be identifying all of them when you design your own experiment. We're going to break each of these down, but the scientific method begins with stating a problem. A problem is going to be the question that you want to answer. Then you're going to make a hypothesis, conduct the experiment, record and analyze your data, make a conclusion, and report your findings so that others can repeat the experiment if necessary. We're going to start with how to make a hypothesis properly. First of all, a hypothesis has to be testable. If we can't test it, it's not a viable hypothesis. In science, people, people can't just make random guesses about anything. We have to actually be able to test the question that we want to answer. It is basically a prediction, but we don't like to use the word guess in science. It is actually a prediction based on the knowledge that we have. We're also going to make sure we use a particular format. If, then, because. We might predict if we drop a ball from a higher height, then it will bounce higher. The if portion of our hypothesis is what you're going to do if I drop a ball from a higher height. Basically, that's what I'm going to test. That's what I'm changing as a scientist. It's my independent variable. I might drop the ball from five feet high, 10 feet high, and 20 feet high. The then portion of my hypothesis is the dependent, the data. What do I think my data is going to show? Well, in my hypothesis, my then is that it's going to bounce higher. 
Throughout an experiment, we always make observations. We use our senses to gather information about the world around us. There are actually two different types of observations that we're going to talk about. We also want to make sure that you understand the difference between an observation and an inference. An observation is something that we can actually sense. I can smell it, I can see it, I can hear it, I can touch it. An inference is typically based on an observation. For example, perhaps Ms. Schultes wears purple all the time. I observe that she wears purple, but my inference would be that her favorite color is purple. I can't directly say that I know Ms. Schulte's favorite color is purple. I'm just basing an inference from the observations that I've made. Here are some examples of the two different types of observations. The first kind is a qualitative observation. These are usually made with our senses. If you break the word down, you can see the word quality in qualitative. They include color, shape, feel, taste, sound. Some examples are included here for you to reference. The other kind of observations are quantitative observations. You can see the word quantity in the word. It's always going to include a number. It's going to be based on a measurement. So for example, the room is 8 meters across, or Sarah is 141 centimeters tall. They have units of measurement that go along with them. An inference, on the other hand, is going to be a logical interpretation. So my example before, if Ms. Schultes is always wearing purple, that's an observation that I make and prior knowledge that I have, and the inference is that Ms. Schultes' favorite color is purple. Here is another example of an inference for you to reference. Go ahead and pause and read through this one for yourself. We also want to make sure that you know what it means to have a scientific theory. It's very different to have a theory in science than in just everyday life. Here's an example for you. The detective has a theory about who robbed the bank. This is a guess. Until he has something to back up his theory, he really doesn't have a theory. It's really just a guess. When scientists use the word theory, it's not just a guess. It is data supported. There is already backup for the theory. So in science, a theory is defined as an explanation that's based on large amounts of data that's collected during repeated experiments. Many theories have been developed over years and years and hundreds of experiments that have been logical and tested, and they're an explanation for events that occur in nature. Here are a few examples for you about theories. You've probably heard of the theory of gravity. The theory of electricity, the germ theory of disease, the theory of evolution, all of these are tested and accepted explanations for events that occur in nature, nature because they are data supported. Theories can really never be completely proven. We only work on disproving them or looking for more data to help support them. When new evidence comes along, we either modify the theory or even get rid of it and start all over again. Here's an example for you of how a theory can be revised. Go ahead and read through this for yourself. Once we've collected some data, we're also going to graph it. The first thing we want to do is identify our variables. The independent variable is always going to go on the x-axis. The dependent variable is always going to go on the y-axis. This is why it's important that you're able to identify them. It's going to also help you set up your graph. You're going to need to determine the range for the data. Typically, we look at the highest data point and the lowest data point. That is your range. And then simply divide by the number of spaces you have available. We want to make sure that when we make a graph, our scale goes up evenly. So for example, by twos, or whatever number, we don't ever want it to say something like 0, 5, 
2022 and have these spaces here be equal because those are not equal intervals. We want to make sure to number and label each axis. We always plot our points, draw your graph. Sometimes this is going to mean where we actually connect the dots of our data. Sometimes we're going to make a best fit line. So that means some of the points may be below or above our line. We're also going to give our graph a title, which is always going to be the Y versus the X axis. So these labels here are actually going to become a part of your title at the top. Once again, in order to make that graph, the independent variable is the thing you changed as the scientist. It's going on the X axis. The dependent variable, remember D and D, dependent data, is going to go on the Y axis. So this is your horizontal, this is your vertical. Range is sometimes difficult for students to be able to figure out. All you need to do is subtract. What's your lowest data point? What's your highest data point? You're going to use this range to determine your scale on your graph. If my lowest data point is 20, I don't need to start my graph at 0. I can actually start it at 20. If my highest data point is 100, that means that I have a range of 80 that my scale needs to go on my graph. Once you've determined the range, you can then determine your scale. We want to make sure that our, our scale is going to be able to fit most of the available space of our graph. We don't want our graphs to only take up this little portion of our graph paper. We want it to take up the entire or as much as possible of the graph. Make sure that you label both your X and your Y axis. We want to make sure to tell everyone very clearly what the graph means. And don't forget units. Units might include minutes that is being recording, recorded, maybe it's centimeters that the plant is growing in. We usually put the units in parentheses. When you plot your data, don't just make dots on the graph and then not connect the points. Sometimes we'll actually connect the points on our graph. Other times we might make a best fit line where some of the data points are below or above our line. If it doesn't clutter your graph, you can even put what this data point is. For example, maybe this data point right here is 1.2 centimeters. And this data point right here is 4.3 centimeters. You don't have to write the centimeters because it's already over here in your label, but if it helps you, you can label your data points. Again, sometimes we will connect the points, sometimes we'll do a best fit. Most graphs in science are not actually connect the dots. A lot of times we're going to have our data points and some of the points are going to be above our line and some of our points are going to be below the line. When we say best fit, that means we want to have an equal number above and an equal number below as well as an equal distance of those above and below the graph. The title should tell us clearly what the graph is about. If your graph has more than one set of data, make sure to provide a key. This is when your graph maybe has two lines on it. Maybe one line is solid and one line is dotted. Make sure to include a key on the side that tells us what the dotted line is and what the solid line is. Our title should always be the X and Y axis labels. It should be a combination of this information on this axis and this information on this axis pulled together to give a clear meaning to the graph.